the armed gang who took on Summerfield, Aldi and Lidl. Will you know them? Welcome to Crime Watch. As always, we're live and the studio is packed with detectives from around the UK, all hoping that your call will help solve a major crime. Over here, we've got a team from Birmingham on the hunt for a gang who spent the summer taking on supermarkets with, would you believe it, one of these things here. It's a crossbow. A store security guard was shot with one just like this. He was lucky to survive. He's going to be joining us later right here in the studio. Over here, we have got a team from Norfolk, hoping to close a murder case dating way back to 1974. The victim has never been identified because when the body was discovered, the head was missing. Tonight, with brand new evidence, detectives hope someone watching will be able to name the victim and shed light on who killed her and why. And Rav's here with his most wanted. Evening, Rav. Evening. Now, as well as my wall of shame, I'm after this gang. They've broken into a warehouse to steal a van load of catalytic converters. They even used the firm's forklift to load their stash. But tonight, we need names. And Matthew Amralawala goes behind the scenes of a murder investigation to see how police cracked it. What have you got for us tonight? Well, we've got a terrible case of a son who murdered his own parents. Now, it was the soil he buried them with that actually led police to their man. OK, your report has all the details on that coming up a little later. But first, a case that has uh, grabbed the headlines recently. Five weeks ago, two Chinese students were tortured and brutally murdered in their Newcastle flat. Even the couple's cat was found drowned in a bowl underneath the kitchen sink. Well, detectives believe the key to solving this is a mystery flatmate who hasn't been seen since. Maybe you know him. Tonight, for the first time, the man in charge, Detective Superintendent Steve Wade, reveals the clues that he has to work with, and hopefully someone watching can help. <laughs> In Newcastle, police have started a murder investigation after two Chinese students were found dead at a flat in the city's West End. The man and woman were found on Saturday and post-mortem results show that both had suffered head injuries. Our correspondent... Boxes. I came into work and they told me that Cece had not come to work uh, and they'd been trying to call her all day. On Saturday, she didn't show up again and we tried to call her and we couldn't get her, so... That's when we kind of had a hunch something was wrong. So we were kind of hoping, like, it's not her. Maybe it's somebody else, they got the wrong house, or somebody else was in the house, and things like that. On Saturday the 9th of August this year, the bodies of Zizou, otherwise known as Sisi, and her boyfriend, Zenzing Yang, otherwise known as Kevin, were discovered behind me here in the flat. It's the first time I've been back to the scene, so we're just going to end it now. OK, we've now entered the crime scene. This is the bedroom where Sissy was found. We've stripped the contents of the room out, but just where I'm pointing was the bed, and at the head of the bed was found Sissy lying face down. Um, she's been bludgeoned to death, probably with a blunt, heavy instrument, possibly a hammer-like instrument. And she'd also been asphyxiated. She'd suffered a terrible death and there were some terrible head injuries. Back into the hallway, and in towards the living room, and at the back of the living room is the bathroom area. Bizarrely, and we can't really understand what this is all about, the, the family cat had actually been drowned in a bucket in the bathroom. And into the rear bedroom, it, it was a scene of um, absolute sheer carnage. Um, Kevin's body was lying in his nightdress on the bed. His head had been bludgeoned in. His throat had been cut. There was blood everywhere in this room. 
There are over 100 police officers working on this investigation, painstakingly going through the evidence. And this is what we believe may have happened. Oh, don't forget the gas bill. Mm. Ten. Do you want anything special tonight? Um, oh, the beef you made last week. You like it, yeah? Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. Sisi worked in Wagamama's restaurant in Newcastle City Centre. She left at 3.40 p.m. She took a bus the short distance to Stanhope Street. Where she got off the bus, it would have taken her no more than a minute to walk home. So we now know that she got into her front door around about 4 p.m. Given that there were two weapons used in this offence, given the gratuitous nature of the violence, given that the couple were separated in two separate bedrooms, I am convinced that there would be two or more offenders involved in this killing. I believe the killers entered and left via this front door shortly after 4 p.m. They must have been wearing either bloodstained clothing or if they weren't, they must have put that blood-stained clothing into some bags. At 5 p.m. that day, three people were standing right outside of the gate. Were they the murderers or were they simply passers-by? We're now five weeks into this murder investigation, which still remains undetected. I believe that the answer to this rests with identifying a mystery lodger. All right, if we put this up, how does it sound? Mm -hmm. 15 minutes walk to city centre, mm -hmm. traffic and shopping are very convenient. Yeah. We know that CC and Kevin had advertised the flat on a Newcastle student's website. We know that a Chinese man had came round to take up the tenancy. Oh, hello. You must be here to see the room. Come in. We now know that Kevin telephoned his mum out in China suggesting that someone had taken up the tenancy. And we also know that Sisi met that man. Young guy, he looked chubby. I don't know, something about him I don't like. Shortly after that telephone call, the bodies of Sisi and Kevin were found brutally murdered. If we can find the mystery lodger, we will solve this murder investigation. So, scene of carnage, as you said, Steve, why on earth were these two young people killed? I don't think we fully understand the motive, to be quite honest with you. However, what we do now know is there was absolutely no cash whatsoever left in the flat. We believed Kevin and Sissy would have had some cash in the flat. Therefore, it's very possible it may have been a robbery or a burglary, possibly. I mean, unsurprisingly, this has attracted a lot of attention in the press. There have been reports that these two young people were involved in some sort, something shady, a betting scam. I mean, could, could this have been a motive? Could they be linked? Yeah, it's possible that it's something to do with an internet betting scam, but the reality is these people weren't leading a very catch-rich lifestyle. Okay. It's, it's very minor sort of stuff. So, but what's equally important is somebody may have thought they were quite cash-rich, and that may be a motive for the attack. What about the cat being drowned in the bowl under the sink? What's that all about? We simply don't know. We don't know the answer to that. Is it possible that the cat was killed or being tortured whilst Kevin and Sissy were in the flat? We simply don't know. It's a bizarre twist to the case. Now, the key to this might well be the mystery lodger chap. Yes, absolutely vital. We do trace the mystery lodger. Um, what we do know is Kevin and Sissy had a room for rent on a Chinese student's website um, prior to that death. What we do know is Sissy telephoned a friend days before the murder. She was uncomfortable with this Chinese lodger, very uncomfortable. She described him as being a young male Chinese, plump build, and he had an earring in, his, in his, one of his ears. It's very important we trace the mystery lodger. As you say, they, they put that on a website. Is there anyone else particularly you want to trace in connection with that? Yes, there are quite a few people. I mean, potentially there may have been more than one lodger, so we need to trace anybody that's been applied for to be a lodger in the flat from the 1st of August. Equally important, there were a number of people seen outside of number 8 Croydon Road at about 5pm on Thursday the 7th of August. For the first time this evening, 
we've managed to get an artist impression of one of the the people that's been described by a witness. Yes, yeah, this has only been done in the last 24 hours. Very yes. hot off the press. Tell us about this. Yes, absolutely. A witness has been traced and she's described the man. Um, she says it's a very good likeness to the, the person she saw. He was wearing a particularly distinctive blue and white football type strip. Um, we need to trace this man. Whether he's involved, we don't really know, but we need to trace this man together with the two other men. With the seriousness and the level of extreme violence, is it likely that a person, one of the people involved, might have spoken about this? Yes, it's, it's perfectly possible that somebody could have just let slip. I mean, one of the things is somebody may have come out of the address covered in blood-stained clothing, got into a car. Has anybody seen anything? But what we really, really need is a name to clinch this important case. We need to find the killers, somebody give with a name. Okay, thanks, Steve. Um, if you can help, do call us. The number's right there. It's on the screen. You could call the independent charity Crime Stoppers as well, anonymously. 0800 treble 5 treble 1. They're offering up to £5,000 reward for information leading to arrest and conviction. If you need to see our reconstruction again, I should tell you that there are Mandarin and Cantonese versions on our website. That might be useful to you. bbc.co.uk slash crimewatch. Now here's Rav with some villains caught on camera. Right, here we go. Watch closely, and if you recognise anyone, get on the phone. A Blackpool warehouse in January, and a group of metal thieves have broken in. They're after the platinum and other precious metals found inside catalytic converters. They pack them onto crates and then onto a waiting van. Then they come back for more, even using the firm's own forklift to load up the van. They got away with 45 grand's worth, but they didn't count on the cameras. Take a look at their faces. It's the third time this firm's been targeted. Let's make it the last. There's a reward. Names, please. A block of flats in Southampton in February, and these men are wanted for a spate of robberies. As many as three in one night. In one case, the victim was threatened and tied up. Police believe one of their victims was deliberately targeted. Make sure they don't strike again. You know what to do. A busy April afternoon at the Duke of York pub in King's Cross and some Chelsea and Newcastle supporters are enjoying a drink after the game. Things start out friendly, but over here, it turns nasty. A chat turns into a punch in the face for this man and more blows as he falls to the floor. The attacker's pulled back by his mate and they both make a run for it. As the pair take off, we follow them every step of the way and round every corner. They think they've escaped. Far from it. At the taxi rank at King's Cross, he tries to hide his face. Too late for that, mate. It's all on camera. Who are they? The man walking towards us is no ticket inspector. He's looking for a victim. He's targeted a woman on the platform at Cuffley Station in Hertfordshire. He moves through the carriages and finds her. He hovers menacingly close before sitting beside her. He then sexually assaults her. When she tries to break free, he punches her in the face. Distraught, she finally manages to get away and her attacker gets off at the next stop. Police believe he approached another woman at the same station earlier in the day. Let's make it the end of the line for him. Think you know anyone? Or call us here in the studio. The number's on your screen now. Remember, you can text us on 63399. Just type crime, space, and then your message. It's really important to leave that space or your message won't get through. Now, if you need a second look at tonight's CCTV, it is, of course, on our website, bbc.co.uk slash crimewatch. Still ahead, can you help close a murder case dating back to 1974? The victim was found tied up in a field in Norfolk. Her head was missing. Police still don't know who she was, but science today provides some strong clues. If we can identify her tonight, chances are we can still find her killer. And the incredible story of how police caught this man 
Roger Severs. He murdered both his parents and buried them in a nearby wood. He then went to extraordinary lengths to cover his tracks, but was caught thanks to mud found on the wheel arches of his parents' car. And I'm joined in the studio by the mother of this lad, Stefan Davidson. He died last week following a drive-by shooting. Someone watching, I reckon, will know who did it. But first, we are after a gang of armed robbers who've had a busy summer in Birmingham. They target supermarkets. So far, they've struck four times, not particularly good at it but they are particularly dangerous. On one occasion, they went armed with a crossbow, just like this one. And as our reconstruction shows, they weren't afraid to use it. The security guard on the receiving end joins me in the studio in just a moment. But first, Rav takes up the story. <laughs> Open and tell them! I felt like I had to do something. I seen him pointing his arm towards me with the crossbow. An armed gang has been busy targeting Birmingham supermarkets this summer. In the space of just five days, they targeted four different stores. These guys are reckless, dangerous, and need to be stopped. It all began in July. Whilst a woman slept, thieves broke into her house, found her keys, and made off with her car. It signalled the start of a crime spree by a gang of wild thugs. Nothing was seen of that car for a week. Then, on the 31st of July, it was used for the gang's first job. By that time, they'd put false plates on it. The three robbers split up. Two head for the storeroom. The third leaps on a counter and screams for money. Over the till! Over the till now! But something distracts him, and the fast-thinking shop assistant hits the alarm. The gang made off empty-handed, but they were clearly desperate for cash. Just 24 hours later, they struck again. This time, armed with one of these. A crossbow. Shortly after 9.30am, the gang made their way to the local Audi supermarket. The store security guard had just started his shift. It was, the, the shop was pretty quiet. There was only about, I'd say about five to 10 people in the shop. There was just one girl on the till. Oh yeah, oh, yeah. you're all right. I guess the manager was in the office. So that's when I just says, let me just walk around and make sure the rest of the shop is okay. Right, man, you ready, yeah? You ready to get this money, yeah? You ready as well, yeah? We are here, we are here, we are, yeah? Armed with a loaded crossbow and hammers at the ready, the robbers burst in. The whole attack is caught on CCTV. When I heard the shouting at the front of the store, I wasn't exactly sure what, what the shouting was. I think it's when I heard the, her screaming, I felt like I had to do something. I just tried to stop it. I just reacted. I realised I was getting hit from behind, so I, I had the two of them hitting me. So what I tried to do was reveal their face so that the camera could get a clear shot. I was looking around for something to use as a, as a weapon, and the only thing I saw was one of the ceramic flower pots. So I picked it up and tried to hold them up with it. That's when I seen the third guy come running towards me. Move. Then I seen him pointing his arm. At the time, I didn't feel the crossbow hit me, but then later on, when I looked at my at my wounds, I saw the hole in my arm. As they run out, I ran out behind them. <laughs> Again, the gang made off with nothing. This meant to... We've had them um, like an armed robber. We've got security guards injured. What's happened to him? They've got him with a crossbow, bleeding. Just get him an ambulance. He's bleeding from his head, yeah? He's bleeding really bad. Please, please. They've got him with a hammer over his head. To be honest, nothing really hurt at the time. It was just 
I was just, it was the, the amount of blood that I seen really shocked me. Kevin's injuries were horrific. I had about seven stitches in the head, three in the ear, I had seven on the shoulder, two on the elbow, and just a bunch of scars and bruises. Two bots jobs in two days. But this lot weren't about to down tools. By the end of the week, they'd taken on another two stores. Here at the little store in Bordersley Green, they struck at closing time, forcing the main doors before bursting in on staff in the office. Get up! Get up! Open the safe! Move! Oh, move! There's money! Go! Move! Oh, please! 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 Get the money! Come on! Don't move! Don't move! Go! 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 They got away with five grand. You can put a stop to this. Here's what we know. It's a gang of three, possibly four. Two black guys, one mixed race. Probably all in their early 20s. This baseball cap is unusual. Who's wearing it? And have another look at this face. Who is it? Did you sell three dust masks and high-vis jackets to the gang at the beginning of August? And do you remember a blue Ford Focus, this distinctive colour, in your street between the 23rd of July and the 7th of August? And where did they get this? If you've got answers, you need to call us. I am going to go back to work. I mean, at the end of the day, as long as everybody's safe, I feel good and my day's done. Well, what about that? I'm joined by Kevin, that incredibly brave security guard who was on the receiving end of the crossbow, and DS Mark Burnell, the detective hunting the gang. Welcome to you both. Sitting here is the very hammer. There were two of these used in the attack, uh, one of each of the guys holding them. Uh, I mean, it's the most vicious-looking hammer I've ever seen. What was going through your mind when they were having a go at you with one of these? Oh, really, I was... I didn't really know, really, because just feeling it at the back of the head really was the main shock part, you know what I mean? But were, you not, were you not completely terrified? I was a bit frightened, but I was more frightened for the girls because I'm here to protect them and I'm here, there to make, make sure they're okay. So it was them I was really worried about. I was just glad it wasn't a gun. So two of these hammers, you say you're glad it wasn't a gun. They, they also had, oh, it's actually, this isn't the exact one, of course, but uh, it's one similar to this, a crossbow. I mean, did you know they had that? I saw him with the crossbow in the beginning, but then he had disappeared while I was fighting with the other two guys with the hammer. So I didn't really worry about him too tough because at the time I was trying to get some kind of control with these guys. You know, Kevin, in our film, and even sitting here talking to you now, you are as cool as a cucumber, and you seem to be taking all of this in your stride. There is every chance that, I mean, they could so easily have killed you. Yeah, I, I know that now. Now I know that, but at the time, I just reacted on instinct, really. Just did what I was supposed to be doing. Uh, Marx, that, that's the case, isn't it? This could so... I mean, it must have just been inches away from being a murder inquiry. That's correct, yes. I mean, they turned up to a uh, supermarket in broad daylight with a loaded crossbow. If that crossbow had have hit somebody in the eye, etc., we could be talking a completely different story. What do you know about the gang? Are they local? Uh, we believe them to be from the Midlands. Um, we also believe them to be between 18 to 20 years old. Um, a gang of four. We know that two are black and one is definitely a mixed race. Uh, and what can you tell us about the car? Uh, the car was stolen overnight in the Kozel area uh, and was recovered on the 8th of July from Hodge Hill, which is part of Birmingham. Now, is, is it reasonable to assume the gang will have blabbed about this? They don't seem the brightest sparks. No. One would suggest that they might be um, new to the game of committing armed robbery. Um, they've foiled on three occasions, been successful on one occasion, um, and I'd appeal to people to look at the CCTV, look at the clothing and piece together the clothing together with the crossbow, the bought hammers and also the waistcoats and dust masks. Yes, I mean, very briefly on that, we don't have much time, but how can people help? What can you tell us about these things that might narrow down the useful search? I mean, that hammer that's been used there is brand new and we believe that they were purchased along with three waistcoats and dust masks, so I appeal to anybody that's sold anything like that um, prior to the 1st of August to come forward. OK, Kevin, thanks very much for taking the time and well done on your recovery. If you can help, then there's the number. It's up on the screen now. Do help. Here's Rap with some of the UK's most wanted. Right, you know the drill. See anyone you recognise, then give us a call. First up is Ming Guo Chen. He's wanted in connection with a hit-and-run in Sheffield in February. The victim was an 85-year-old war veteran 
hit by a silver VW Passat as he crossed the road. He later died in hospital. Chen's 33 and also calls himself Chang. Number two is Lee Tanzi, wanted in connection with an armed robbery on a bank in June. Three men armed with a sledgehammer, crowbar and machete burst into the Darwin branch of Lloyd's TSB in Lancashire. They were demanding money. The gang made off with a cash in a waiting Audi. Tansy's six foot one and has a tattoo on each arm. There's a 25,000 pound reward leading to an arrest and conviction. Number three is Alan Mills and he's charged with a serious drug offence in March this year. He was granted bail and was due in court last month but failed to turn up. Mills is 61 and has connections to Tilbury, Essex and Hackney in London. And John Platt is next. He's wanted for sex offences against children, including rape and attempted rape in Oldham. He was arrested in May 2004, but jumped bail and hasn't been seen since. He's 46 and may have connections in Ireland. So if you can help, don't wait. Phone or text. The number's on your screen now. And this lot are also on our website, bbc.co.uk forward slash crimewatch. Yeah, and it really is worth taking a look at our website. And we now have a range of web appeals. That's additional cases that you could help solve online. We've got more wanted faces too, and of course all of tonight's reconstructions and CCTV. If you want to keep across all the developments on Crime Watch cases, the arrests, police breakthroughs, and what's coming up then, you can register for this. It's our Crime Watch newsletter. It's free. We'll email it to you roughly once a month. All you need to do is sign up online, bbc.co.uk slash crimewatch. Now, for something of a mystery. Back in 1974, a woman's body was discovered in a field in Norfolk. She'd been murdered and, somewhat bizarrely, her head was missing. For over 30 years, police have been unable to identify her and, without knowing who she is, there's very little chance of solving the crime. Well, tonight, we need you to play detective. Can you piece together the clues that Science Night provides and give us that all-important name? Watch closely, and if you can help, do call us. Somewhere out there is a brutal killer who for 34 years has kept a very sinister secret and I personally would like to find him. Even uh, by standards of the modern world, this was a pretty brutal killing. Police, there's a body in our field. She's definitely dead. Her head's missing. Well, th this woman was discovered in a, a rural location uh, near Swaffham in Norfolk, uh, and she was found dumped, uh, clearly having been murdered, and uh, the body had been decapitated, and the head has never been found. She was found in a St. Michael pink nightgown. First thing that leads me to think is that this person has very likely been murdered in a home, very likely in her own home, because uh, it would be unusual, to say the least, for people to run about in the streets dressed only in a nightdress. And I think that's an important flavour to the case, that this might well have actually been a domestic killing of some sort. The body was bound up in, in a way that would, would be likely to facilitate transportation, really, with the arms bound behind the back and the legs bent at the knees. She could have come from anywhere. This, this, this is the thing. I mean, the, where she was found is quite near a main road, and she, well, she, she could have been murdered miles away and, and just dumped there. Ah. 
Well, of course, it was important to, to search the whole of the scene and the area around the scene. We, we spent a long time, obviously, looking for the head. The main thing was to get the body to the mortuary and arrange for a pathologist to examine the body. He was able, for instance, to identify the fact that she was of short stature, something in the region of five foot two or so, and that she was of plump build. And although it, it sounds like not a lot, uh, you would think in, in a fairly small community, somebody would know, well, that sounds a bit like such and such, who w went missing a few weeks ago. The first thing we were trying to achieve was to identify who this young lady was. Um, and in order to do that, we embarked on a process to trace every woman of the description of the young, per the young woman who was found. And um, that consisted of mainly doing house-to-house -house inquiries. Well, of course, in those days, we had no computer systems. We had no m mobile telephones. We had a very limited method of communicating and of keeping information. And every piece of information that came into the incident room needed to be indexed. And we used this, this system here. In fact, these are some of the cards from the incident room. We probably visited and spoke to about 15,000 people in the six weeks of the main part of the inquiry. But the original investigation soon ran out of steam. I think all of us felt a sense of, um, of frustration and sadness that we hadn't identified either the victim or, of course, the perpetrator. I still think that had we been able to find out who she was, we would have solved it. 34 years later, and the case is reopened. DI Andy Guy is now in charge. Firstly, uh, I reviewed that the whole file, everything we had has been examined and re-looked at. We've also had a look at the exhibits, the nightdress that she was wearing, the string, the, the cover that she had, and we've carried out various tests on those, uh, and there are still some results that we're waiting for. But the most important thing is we exhumed the, the, the woman on the 16th of April this year, and um, from there we were able to get a DNA profile. So now we have a reference point of the, of, the, of the woman's identity. We just need to put a name to that woman. After three decades underground, the victim's body was reduced to just bones. A forensic anthropologist was drafted in to examine them. Well, the bones can be very much affected by the conditions in which they are lying. And some bones can be very badly damaged and some almost not at all. Now, in this case, the bones were slightly worn away by water passing through the grave. But they were still largely well enough preserved that I could get some evidence from them. One of the key things I was able to find from the pelvis was a slight change that suggests that this woman might have had a pregnancy, which is a new piece of information to the investigation. I've got here two bones of the pelvis to show you. And this one, you can see, is quite plain in this area, whereas this one is damaged. And this is the damage that takes place in late pregnancy. It's not absolute proof, but it's quite suggestive. The most frustrating thing about this case is that it is so solvable. The, the woman that's here would have been known to somebody. They would have had friends, neighbours, sisters. One phone call from that person could turn this case around very quickly. I've always felt how sad it is that we've got that young lady in the cemetery at Swaffham in an unmarked grave and how nice it would be for us to be able to put a marked headstone on her grave with all of her details and some message from her relatives. Well, I'm joined now by D.I. Andy Guy. It seems amazing to me, Andy, that back in the summer of 1974, no one came forward to say that this poor young woman was missing. Well, lots of women were reported to Norfolk Police as missing in 74. In fact, the original inquiry did locate 109 of these people nationwide. But of course we know that a lot of people that go missing are never ever reported to the police. And the other thing, that the other problem we have is that um, it may be possible that we missed a woman reported to us in the original inquiry. Yeah, I mean, in a sense, the bad old days, really, we saw the hundreds of index cards and sure. old-fashioned policing. Of course, things have changed a lot now. Yeah. DNA profiling being a significant part of this investigation now. Yeah. 
what I'm hoping tonight is that someone will ring up with a name of, of missing females, and what we can do from there is go to the family of those females that were missing in 74 and are still missing now, obtain a DNA profile from the family, and then compare it with the victim uh, that was buried in Swatham Churchyard. Now, for somebody who may have had a young female friend that went missing, there is a very important fact here. We saw from the uh, pathologist, the forensic pathologist, that her pelvis showed signs of, if not childbirth, then certainly a very late pregnancy. That's sure. a big difference from the clues in 1974. That's absolutely right. The original post-mortem suggested that a woman had never had children, and women, missing persons, were ruled out of the inquiry because they hadn't had children. But of course now, Corinne and Nat are saying to us that there's a strong possibility that she did have children, or at least get into the late stages of childbirth. OK, so this tonight might be your final big last shot at it. Who is it that you're appealing to tonight to get in touch? OK, well, people don't just go missing. When they disappear, they are missed by people. So what I'd appeal to anybody who had a, a family member, a friend, a work colleague, or somebody used to socialise with, that went missing in 1974 and is still missing today to get in touch. Even if they reported that person missing back in 74, give us another call. OK, and we also want to remind people you don't need any more information on the night dress or indeed uh, this cover-up that was used here that we saw in the film. You've, you've exhausted those possibilities. Absolutely. It's missing people. Yeah. OK, thanks, Andy. If, if you can help, then the number is there on the screen. If you've been a victim of crime, that is, of course, the victim support line, 0845 30 30 900. And if you are interested, I have to say I am, in the fascinating work of the two experts that were featured in that reconstruction. We've uh, filmed some special interviews with them from our website. The forensic pathologist, for example, talks about his role on the So Murders investigation and the case of the five women you'll remember murdered on the streets in Ipswich. That's at bbc.co.uk slash crimewatch. Now here's Rav with some good news on previous cases. Two years ago, we appealed for your help to find a rapist wanted for two separate attacks on women in West Yorkshire over a nine-year period. The most recent happened on Ilkley Moor. A 52-year-old woman was out walking her dog when she was approached by a man. She was knocked to the ground, threatened with a knife and punched in the face repeatedly until she lost consciousness. Now a man has been charged with a number of offences, including rape, kidnap and attempted murder. He'll face trial later in the year. And positive developments on a case we featured back in 2005. A flat in Harlow in Essex was targeted in an arson attack. The fire took hold and trapped the couple in the flat above. The fire was so fierce they were unable to get out. By the time firefighters reached them, they were both unconscious. Well, Kerry Youngs died two days later in hospital. Her partner, Kevin Chappell, suffered brain damage and will require 24-hour care for the rest of his life. Five people have now been charged in connection with that attack. And good news on a gang of armed thugs who took on a string of jewellers around the country. They thought they were masters of disguise. Right, you get on the floor! As a direct result of our appeal, all three men were caught and sent down. You may recall we featured the case last month on Crime Watch Solved. All good until one of the men, Elliot Burton, did a runner during the trial. We reappealed for him and following our programme, he finally did the right thing and handed himself in. That disappearing act, though, cost him an extra six months behind bars. The gang got a total of 28 and a half years. Now, last month in the centre of Birmingham, Stefan Davidson was sitting in a car with three of his mates. Another car pulled up alongside and a chase followed, during which at least four shots were fired. One bullet smashed the rear windscreen and hit Stefan in the back of the neck. Well, he was rushed to hospital, but tragically, just last week, he died. Stefan's mum, Maxine, joins us now, along with the man hunting her son's killer, DCI, Tim Bacon. Uh, Maxine there will not be a parent watching who will not dread the situation that you are in. Uh, tell me how it was that you heard, first of all, that Stefan had been hurt. I was, at, um, I was at work and I got a phone call saying he'd been shot and I need to get to the hospital right away. So I had to leave what I was doing and just head out to the hospital. What a shock for you. I mean, what was it like to get that sort of news? Really devastating it was, and because I didn't know how serious it was, 
I kind of knew it was serious because of how the phone, phone calls sounded. So it was very devastating for me. So Stefan was in hospital, as I said, for a month. He was battling with the care of all the great doctors and nurses around him to stay alive. But that must have been an incredibly difficult period for you and your family. It was very difficult. We spent most of our time at the hospital, and not really leaving his bedside for about two weeks out of that, we spent day and night at the hospital. And then just hoping, I mean, we were just hoping and praying that he was gonna come round. Tell me about Stefan, what kind of a boy was he? Oh, God. Um, just, he's so lovely, he's such a lovely person. He's fun, so loving, he had so much love to give. Um, Maxine, we'll just, we'll just take a minute and talk to Tim. Uh, DCI Tim Bacon God. is here. Um, mm. This is devastating, obviously, for everybody who knew and continues to love Stefan. Why do you think it happened? What happened? Yeah, we'd seen a, over the last couple of months a rise in tension between um, some Birmingham or local gangs in Birmingham. Um, and what we now know is that we've linked these uh, series of attacks, we've linked those together. Um, Stefan's murder is one of those attacks. What we know um, on the day that this took place was that Stefan, as you say, had been in the car with his friends, been driving around town. Um, there's nothing to suggest at all at the time of this that they'd done anything provocative, that they'd done anything other than uh, driving through the city. Um, and what we know is that another vehicle drew alongside the car that Stefan was in, um, that a gun was pointed at the car, um, that the car that Stefan was in was then driven away, followed by this other car, and that the passenger in the other car um, was leaning out of the window, firing shots at the car that Stefan was in. What about that guy? What can you tell us about the killer? What do you right. know so far? What we can say is that we know that up to three black males were in this other car, the silver Toyota, and that one of those males, the front seat passenger, was the person that was firing at the car that Stefan was in. Um, tell us a little bit, just round up once more for people who are watching, what you know for definite about this car. Okay. We know that this is a silver Toyota Aventis car. The number of it is FE03JXW. That's really important because there are a lot of silver Toyota Aventis cars out on the road. We are only interested in this particular one. We need to know where it is now. Uh, has it been taken to a scrapyard? Is it parked on a car park? Is it parked by the, by the side of the road? Um, we need to know where that car is tonight. OK, for nice thanks, Tim. Uh Maxine, there's obviously a big team and they are working very, very hard to try to find out who killed the son you love so much. Um, we have a lot of viewers. I wonder if you want to just talk directly either. It could be to the person who did it or it could be to the person who knows who did it. As to the person who did it, I'd say just hand yourself in and somebody out there knows who he is. Somebody out there knows who killed my son and as mothers, parents, if it's your son that's done it, I'd advise you to hand him in. Call the police. Anybody that knows to contact the police. Maxine, I know how difficult it was for you to talk to us, and we really do appreciate it, and we hope that this helps. If you can help, then please do call us here in the studio. Now here's Rab with more faces in the frame. Right, let's see if you recognise any of this lot. Number five is John Blackstock, wanted for a series of thefts and deceptions up and down the country. He's believed to have posed as a Royal Marine and a police officer and has no less than 33 aliases. He has a Scottish accent and may have been in Wiltshire, but where is he tonight? Six is a Philip Wilson and he's wanted in connection with an assault at the King George IV pub in Pinner, Middlesex back in January. The victim was stabbed in the stomach. Wilson is 44 and has links to Hemel Hempstead and Hillingdon. Jeremy Sheridan is my number seven. Police want to speak to him about a violent rape in Sheffield 17 years ago. He's got links to the travelling community in Essex and has been spotted in Billericay and Saffron Walden. He also uses the aliases of Jeremiah Sheridan and Dan O'Brien. Last up is Mustak Chowdhury, my number eight. He's wanted for robbing two betting shops in 2006. He was arrested but skipped bail and hasn't been seen since. He's 35 and has connections to Luton. So get dialing the numbers there on your screen now or you can text us on 63399. Just type crime, space and then your message. Don't forget to leave that space 
or your message won't get through. Now, do you know, we've had 41 calls on that crossbow robbery in Birmingham, the one that poor Kevin was caught up on. One, crucially, saying that they are pretty sure they know where all the stuff for that robbery was bought. I'm talking about the hammers, those high-visibility jackets, and also the masks the chaps were uh, wearing across their faces. So that is an interesting development. Right, it's time now for a behind-the-scenes look at how detectives in Leicestershire solved the double murder of Derek and Eileen Severs. This is them. Turns out they were butchered by their own son and buried in a nearby wood. Police had little to go on except a massive hunch and a small lump of mud found on the couple's car. Matthew Amralawala takes up the story. Derek and Eileen Severs were pillars of their community in Hambleton in Leicestershire. He was a successful businessman. She had been awarded an MBE for her charity work. They were well known to everyone in the village where they'd lived for over 20 years. And then they just disappeared. Without warning, Eileen stopped turning up for work. Derek missed his business appointments. To their friends and colleagues, it made no sense. Derek and Eileen had been missing for a week. Friends called the police and they visited the house. Hello, sir. DC Green, Leicestershire Police. I'm here about your parents. Are they about? Down south for the week. Oh, uh, not right if I look around. Not at all. Okay, great, thank you. There was no sign of the couple, just their son Roger. But he didn't seem at all concerned. You've not just spoken to him lately? Not since Tuesday. Mum says they're coming back on Monday. Oh, that's nice. Where are they staying? I didn't think to ask. Oh, yeah. What happened here then? No carpet. Mum's bath overflowed, uh, so I ripped it up. Right, okay. Nasty that when that happens, isn't it? Yeah. I had that done in mine. Nasty still, I suppose you'll get it on the insurance, won't you? Sir? Yeah. What happened here then? No carpet either. Dad dropped the chip pan. Wasn't a great weekend for them. That doesn't sound like it, does it? Why weren't your officers convinced by that? The explanations were not good. Wetting carpets isn't enough to get rid of carpets. Fat on the carpets, maybe. It might be. But put the two things together with people missing, it looked very sinister. It looked as if what we got here was a cover-up. Now, if those missing carpets had suggested something sinister, what about Roger himself? Roger was too calm. There was oddities about the house. Instinct said something seriously was wrong here. The story is just not adding up. Within 48 hours, they arrested Roger Severs on suspicion of murder. Now, you made your move as police really early. You made an arrest. Why so early? You only had the missing carpets to go on. It was instinct. Uh, it was instinct that he was not telling the truth. It was instinct that they hadn't gone away as he said they had. And the answer was, he'd probably kill them. Could Roger Severs really have murdered his own parents? It seemed unthinkable. The police needed hard evidence. Cold, painstaking but necessary work. 60 police officers have been searching countryside today as concern grows about Derek and Eileen Severs. They live in a large house on the edge of the village of Hambleton. The investigation had to start at the house. Once we'd arrested him, the house was completely sealed and I handed it over completely to a forensic team to do full analysis. Immediately, forensic officers were drawn to Mr Severs' car. It was covered in mud and that just didn't seem right. To see a grubby car, and yet with these people who were so neat and tidy, just looked out of place, that, you know, that, that, that didn't seem right. So we thought, again, there was something significant here that needed further investigation. They found what they were looking for in the boot, traces of blood. It seemed likely whoever had killed the couple had used their car to dispose of the bodies. If the car has been used to remove the bodies, which is what we initially thought, could the soil on the car, the mud on the sides of the car, tell us where it's been? The forensics team hoped the mud on the car would lead them to the bodies. If it did, it would be a massive breakthrough. The main samples that we took from the car were underneath the wheel arches, the reason being that that had accumulated the most uh, material. And you could take off a, 
a stratified layer and therefore obviously that meant uh, that some more interpretation could be made as to the sequence of events that had occurred. If they could find where the mud on the car had come from, chances are they would find the bodies. And forensic work carried on at the Severs bungalow, where more clues suggested the couple had been violently attacked. In the bathroom, we, we found a, a, a significant distribution of blood. Um, obviously, the carpet was missing, and we, we, we rather suppose that would have told us an awful lot if it were there. Um, but we did find uh, a lot of low-level fine spray um, distributed around the bathroom, which is indicative of repeated hits on a body. Had the couple been murdered in their own bathroom? Only finding the bodies could provide the answer. We had hundreds of volunteers come out and walk the woods, walk the fields, walk the area, trying to see if they could find the body. We did searches of Rutland water. It's an immense stretch of water. We had divers in there. We had low-flying planes going over it. We even used sonar to see if there were any objects in the deep water that might be bodies. All of it was completely negative. Despite the massive search, there was no sign of Derek and Eileen dead or alive. But the results from the soil lab were about to blow the case wide open. Scientists analysed the minerals, pollens and organic matter in the soil. They proved the mud on the car could only have come from two small areas of local woodland. It was amazing. So instead of looking over the whole of Rutland, the whole of Leicestershire, the, the area that the car could have driven in in a short time, it brought us right down to where we were actually dealing with the murder. So this is where all of that brought you. What did you do then? You have to put practicalities into it. What we knew was that Mr Severs was a big man. He was 20 stone. And Roger, as far as we know, was working on his own. So he couldn't move him very far. So I set search parameters of 50 metres within vehicle access. And this is vehicle access, so we're searching within 50 metres of this. So one of the searchers got to a point about where we are now, and what he saw in front of him was some soil, a pile of soil that didn't seem to fit in with the rest of the forest floor. And as he pulled the soil away, what he saw and what he felt was cold flesh. He'd come across the back of Mr. Severs. It's a terrible moment, but it's an extraordinary moment for the investigation, because the purpose of the search was to find the bodies, and we'd actually done it. This is the place that the science had led us to, this is the place that the soil said you should look, and it all came to fruition. It was here. Police could now prove the unthinkable, that Roger Severs had murdered his parents and buried them in the woods. But it wasn't until the case got to court that Roger Severs finally admitted what he'd done. His story of his parents' murder begins in the kitchen as the family prepared steak for dinner. Where do you want this, Oh, lovely. Hey. Sing, the problem was Roger's life had been one failure after another. Dad? Yeah? We've got this uh, business uh, venture. It's a pub. Roger. Position. Roger. Roger. I just have a feeling I know where this is. He was going. now 37, and his parents were sick of supporting him. The answer to that is no, this because is I. What the no, because she's going to ask me for money. Now, listen, Luke, well up and the wall. Is is not not they not argued. Another you and your hairbrain schemes. It's not a hairbrain scheme. You've got to stand on your own. Roger lost his temper. Mum struck eight times. That left Dad. Ten blows. Bodies, backseat and boot. To the woods. Buried. The cleaner. We know all about Roger's efforts to hide his tracks by cleaning up the gory evidence of the crime. When police searched the house, they found a killer's to-do list on the kitchen table. Clean the wheelbarrow, clean the car, clean the bathroom. But, however hard he cleaned, he couldn't hide the fact he'd murdered his own parents. Roger Severs was sent down with two life sentences. 
So mild-mannered Roger, not so mild-mannered after all, then? No, I mean, he had one conviction of deception, but nothing to suggest he was capable of such a, a terrible, terrible crime. I mean, it was unusual in a lot of ways. The detectives said they, they almost had to work this case backwards. Right. With most murder investigations, they had the body pretty early on, and that takes them towards the perpetrator. This time, they had the suspect early on, but yeah. no bodies, and I suppose that is where the science then led them to. Yeah, the, the old-fashioned hunch and the soil. I mean, the soil uh, connection and what they managed to do with that is, is quite mind-boggling. It's incredible. It was a scientific first. I mean, they had thought about this and used it generally, but nothing like this, nothing so specific. Every aspect of this soil, the mud from the car, was analysed. They broke it down to about 24 components and built up almost an environmental fingerprint that narrowed down this huge, huge search area to one specific site. And, I mean, this sort of technique is now commonplace. The UN have used it in uh, war crimes investigations in Bosnia and also in parts of Africa. And it is the case, explain a bit more about this, that it was soil that led them to the bodies, but then other soil led them back to Roger. It was incredible, because if the mud on the car took police to the bodies, yeah. then the soil they found there led them right back round to Roger, because what he'd done was he'd taken the soil from the family allotment to actually bury his parents. Two and a half tonnes, right. and it was an exact match. And then, bizarrely also, they found a really rare type of potato found with the buried bodies. When they went back to the allotment, guess what? They were growing exactly the type of rare potato. So you had this circle of soil right in the centre of it, Roger Severs. And when he was in court, I mean, he, he did fess up, he admitted. Well, he said it was diminished responsibility, he said he was depressed, but uh, it was so cold, it was so calculated that the jury saw right through it. Guilty, both counts of murder. Thanks, Matthew. Now, here's Rav with a roundup of what's happening on the phones. Yeah, a really good response have you heard from Kirsty about the Birmingham crossbow robbers, but we don't really want any more calls on where to buy a crossbow, unless, of course, you can help about it being sold, along with the high jackets and dustmasters those attackers wore. Then the Chinese double murder, we've slightly disappointed five calls on that, <coughs> but do remember there's a Mandarin and Cantonese version of that reconstruction on the website, so check it out. Right, that's all for now. Details on all of tonight's cases are on our website, bbc.co.uk slash crimewatch. Don't forget, you can also sign up there for our free newsletter. Our phone lines are open until midnight tonight. Also, they open again at 7.30 tomorrow morning. Our next programme is on Monday the 13th of October, but don't go away tonight because, of course, we're back. The team's back with news, a full update on what's been happening on the phones this evening. It's looking pretty interesting. If you can help, but you haven't called... Please do it now. It could all be down to you. I'll see you again, 10.35. Do join me, but for now, bye-bye.